AUKUS. This is this new defense alliance between Australia, the UK, and the US, hence AUKUS. Uh, and it is just another blatant provocation aimed at China. They can say whatever they want. Uh, the Western media doesn't believe that and isn't reporting it that way. And China doesn't perceive it that way. So even if it was some in innocent defense alliance, it has been completely perceived by everyone on all sides as a provocation. Let's look at The Guardian first. Alliance with Australia and US, a down payment on global Britain. So this is about getting Britain out, back out, uh, doing interventions all around the globe again, uh, pretty much as it has been doing side by side with the US since the, the 21st century started. Uh, think uh, the war in Afghanistan, the war with Iraq, Libya, Syria, the UK has been side by side with the US through all of those uh, absolute crimes against humanity, the worst crimes against, the humani uh, against humanity of the 21st century. So let's read this Guardian piece. Uh, Britain's post-Brexit foreign policy is taking shape and the early moves are hardly very surprising. Yes, what would be surprising about the UK just continuing to be uh, a, a, a partner in the US and all of these acts of aggression all around the world. There's nothing surprising about that at all. A tripartite defense alliance with the US and Australia, handily compressed to AUKUS, clearly designed to send a message to Beijing. And it's important to point out that none of these leaders actually mentioned China by name, but of course everyone knows that that's what they're talking about when they say security challenges in the Indo-Pacific region, they mean China. And then you have to ask yourself, why don't they just say China? Because they know if they say China, then they have to qualify what those threats actually are. And then they would be back up against the wall like they were ahead of the invasion of Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and Syria. They would have this very blatant lie that they would have to tell from the very beginning that people would be able to dismantle. So the more ambiguous they can be, the better. Here's, here's another crucial part of this so-called AUKUS alliance. Three start work by sharing with Canberra what is ultimately an American technology supplying nuclear reactors to power submarines with the likely assistance of Britain's Rolls-Royce and BAE systems, a relationship that may also allow the Australians to ditch a troubled but lucrative uh, 90 billion Australian dollar diesel engine agreement with a French contractor. It's important to point out that they're just going to be planning this for the next year and a half. And then when they finally lay down the first of these nuclear powered submarines, it could be years before they're finished construction and then another year or two uh, when they're doing their sea trials uh, before they're commissioned and put into service. So that's important to keep in mind. There is a time frame the U.S. is trying to engineer a conflict with China as soon as possible. These submarines will most likely not be ready when that conflict is fought. But these submarines might be ready when the conflict is concluded. And if they succeed in knocking down China economically and significantly, I'm talking about uh, pushing China and the rest of Asia back decades, this would be already in place in the works and prepared as a kind of follow-on strategy to keep uh, all of Asia contained and subordinated to the West. Now, let's talk about the supposed security threats the U.S. is citing as, as the basis for creating this alliance. Well, the U.S., the U.K., and Australia, uh, all of their leadership are citing these supposed threats in the South China Sea uh, regarding Taiwan, human rights abuses in Xinjiang that they claim are going on. Where is all of this coming from? It's coming from corporate funded think tanks like ASPE, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. And look who sponsors them. They're sponsored by arms manufacturers. These are the companies that are going to make billions upon billions through these weapons programs being conjured up on the fear of what they claim China represents to, to the region and to the world. Just keep that in mind. Now, let's look at the South China Sea because this is what we're always told is the reason the US needs to create alliances like the Quad, which was Australia, Japan, India, and the US, and now AUKUS, Australia, the UK, and US. They say China is bullying all of these countries in the South China Sea with these excessive claims over the waters and the, the islands and the reefs in the region, and they're building these artificial islands. 
Everyone is doing that in the South China Sea, not just China. And this, this isn't Chinese media saying this. This map is from The Economist. It shows you all of these overlapping claims. So it's not just China versus all of these countries, but all of these countries have disputes with each other as well. There was a tribunal at the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague, the Netherlands. This isn't a real court. It's not under the UN. It has no real authority. It's kind of like a neutral friend two people would go to to help resolve a dispute. Uh, but this tribunal that the US, the US organized, and uh, it was an American lawyer. This is him right here in this New York Times article, Paul Reichler. And it was a US law firm that actually brought this to this, this court of arbitration on behalf of the Philippines. And so with no surprise, this court ruled in favor of the Philippines against China. And the US was saying, see, this international court has recognized that China is, has excessive claims. This actually belongs to the Philippines. But it, it, it's very interesting because regarding the exact same tribunal, the New York Times also wrote this, Taiwan, after rejecting South China Sea decision, sends patrol ships. So it just goes sh to show you the, the true nature of what's going on in the South China Sea. It's all of these overlapping disputes, not just with China, but all of these countries with each other as well. Uh, Taiwan as a, as a territory, part of China, but uh, treated by the US de facto as some sort of independent country. It actually sent its own patrol ships to contest this ruling that the US itself organized on behalf of the Philippines. So it's a bit farcical, isn't it? And even though that the tribunal was organized on behalf of the Philippines to give this favorable ruling to the Philippines, this is how the Philippines actually decided to deal with its, its disputes with China. They did not take that ruling and wave it around. It, it meant, first of all, it meant nothing. Second of all, it would have completely destroyed the Philippines' relationship with China. China is their largest trade partner. So this is what they did instead. And this is recent, May 2021. Philippines, China convened mechanism to ease tensions, explore cooperation in South China Sea. This is from the Department of Foreign Affairs, Republic of the Philippines. This is a win-win for the Philippines and China. And, and if all of the countries in the region uh, decided that they were going to treat these as just minor maritime disputes, which happen all over the world, and that they would try to resolve them bilaterally, and even seek cooperation in disputed territory, uh, that would be the best for everyone in the region. It's very obvious that that, that is the best. And so what is the US doing? It's inserting itself into these ordinary maritime disputes. It's disrupting any attempt to, to resolve them bilaterally, nation to nation, and it is trying to uh, escalate this into a conflict, a regional conflict. And now because they're dragging in the UK, uh, Australia, which it's in the Pacific, but it's, it's very, look on the globe, how f actually how far away it is from China. I think parts of Alaska are closer to China than Australia is. Uh, I could be wrong, but it, it, check it out on a globe. It's pretty close. And, and I just want to kind of reinforce this. This is also from the New York Times. This was from this year, earlier this year. UK and France call in the Navy, sort of, in Channel Islands fishing dispute. So even Europe, European countries have these maritime disputes with one another and they can get very heated. And military vessels brought in, the UK and, and, and France sent their naval vessels out to assert themselves amid this claim. But then it calmed down. It didn't even come close to a conflict and neither does it in the South China Sea. And just to drive this point home, and uh, notice that this Voice of America article, I had to use the Internet Archive to, to call it up because it seems like it was erased from their website. And, it, and, and I don't know why they did that, but I have some ideas and you'll see it after I, I'm done reading it. Indonesia, Malaysia destroying foreign boats to defend maritime claims. And look how dramatic this is. They are blowing up boats. Uh, they're lighting them on fire and sinking them to warn their, these other claimants in the region to stay out of their waters, waters that they have claimed. And there's nobody on these boats. People aren't dying in this. It's a, it's a very political thing that they're doing and they're asserting themselves in these disputes. And all of these countries are doing it 
to each other. Look at this from Vietnamese news. Malaysia, Malaysian Navy seizes Vietnamese fishing boats. So this is about Vietnamese fishing boats being seized by Malaysia. Look at this Bangkok Post article. Uh, 2016, three Malaysian trawlers seized near Saton. Uh, this is the Royal Thai Navy seizing these Malaysian fishing vessels. Sometimes Thai vessels are seized in waters that, that other countries think they shouldn't be in. And it goes around like that. And then they all get on the phone and they talk. The, the fishermen are released. Sometimes they get their boats back and everything just keeps going. It's just the nature of all of these countries being uh, in close proximity and how comp complicated it gets because of all of the overlapping economic exclusion zones and, and just the nature of the region and the history of the region, you get all of these overlapping claims. So it's, it's very obvious that there's all of these disputes. They're not major conflicts. They, there's no threat of them ever becoming a major conflict. It's not just China bullying all these countries. All of these countries have these disputes with one another. The US is very clearly exaggerating all of this and also just lying about it. And then what else is the US doing? It's inserting itself directly into these disputes to escalate them into a conflict. So this is from the US Navy's official website, navy.mil. Seventh Fleet conducts freedom of navigation operation. And this is July 12th, 2021. On July 12th, USS Benfold asserted navigational rights and freedoms in the vicinity of the Parcel Islands, consistent with international law. Uh, and this is very ironic. They're claiming that the international law of the seas, as reflected in the 1982 Law of the Sea of Convention, provides for certain rights and freedoms and other lawful uses of the sea to all nations. Almost every country on Earth has signed this 1982 Law of the Sea Convention. Almost every country in the world has, except the U.S. There's, there's a couple of others, but the U.S. has not signed this, and yet they're, used, they're citing it as the justification for them to go all the way across the Pacific Ocean to the South China Sea to carry out these freedom of navigation operations. And down here, China, Taiwan, and Vietnam each claim sovereignty over the Parcel Islands. So they're admitting it's not just China and, and some other country that they're bullying. They admit that it's all of these overlapping claims. Uh, ta Taiwan and Vietnam have overlapping claims with each other that they will argue about and fight over. It's not just China. So they're even saying that in this official U.S. Navy statement. And then the rest of the statement is all about how the U.S. doesn't recognize anything that China says about the South China Sea. But you have to keep reminding yourself, this is the U.S. Navy crossing an entire ocean to get to the South China Sea to insert itself into these disputes. What right does it have to do that? They also keep uh, citing free trade and unimpeded commerce. Which nation do you think benefits the most from free trade through the South China Sea? And which nation do you think wants to avoid as much as possible any sort of conflict that could impede on commerce? China, not the US, China. China dominates global trade. All of the nations in the region, their largest trade partner is China. Why would they want to jeopardize that? Uh, but guess who does want to jeopardize that? The United States. I've pointed this out before and I'm, and I'm going to keep bringing this up over and over again. This is a 2016 Rand Corporation paper titled War with China, Thinking Through the Unthinkable. It was commissioned by the U.S. military in 2016. And uh, I just want to show you on page nine, it says, we postulate that a war would be regional and conventional. It would be waged mainly by ships on and beneath the sea, by aircraft and missiles of many sorts, and in space against satellites and cyberspace against computer systems. We assume the fighting would start and remain in East Asia, where potential Sino-US flashpoints and nearly all Chinese forces are located. So they're admitting that China, its military, is based in China, where a nation's military should be based in its own territory. It's also admitting that there's all of these uh, Chinese US flashpoints, the South China Sea, as you can see there, they're injecting themselves into that deliberately to, to create a flashpoint there. There's also the issue with Taiwan, which many people don't know this, but 
Um, virtually no country on earth recognizes Taiwan as a country. They recognize it as part of China under the one China policy. The U.S. doesn't even have a, an official embassy in Taiwan. Go look it up if you don't believe me. They don't because officially they don't recognize Taiwan as a country. Unofficially, they are encouraging the, the current government that they backed, that they helped put into power. They're encouraging them to declare independence, to deliberately create a flashpoint between the U.S. and China to fight this conflict that the Rand Corporation is describing in its document. Let's continue. We also assume that China would not attack the U.S. homeland except via cyberspace, given its minimal capability to do so with conventional weapons. In contrast, U.S. non-nuclear attacks against military targets in China could be extensive. The time frame studied is 2015 to 2025. Uh, so right there, they're admitting that even if China wanted to attack the U.S. homeland, they don't have the capability to do it, not with conventional weapons. They're also admitting that there is this window of opportunity for the U.S. to fight a limited conflict confined to East Asia against China and have a favorable outcome between 2015 and 2025. So you can see how the window is closing very quickly. On page 14, it says, a long and severe war could ravage China's economy, stall its hard-earned development, and cause widespread hardship and dislocation. Such economic damage could in turn aggravate political turmoil and embolden separatists in China. And I've talked about how the U.S. has deliberately created and cultivated these separatist groups uh, in Xinjiang, the, the Uyghur separatists. There has been a Tibet separatist movement backed by the U.S. since the 1950s. The U.S. was behind the unrest and the violence in Hong Kong. They're also behind multiple campaigns of destabilization in nations bordering China. Afghanistan, for example, Myanmar, the, the U.S.-backed opposition there is killing people in the streets and fighting the military with war weapons right now, right on China's border. And they have anti-Chinese opposition groups in Thailand, in Malaysia, uh, in the Philippines, all trying to agitate against China and, and to ruin the relationship these nations have with China. So keep that in mind. In contrast, U.S. domestic partisan skirmishing could handicap the war effort, but not endanger societal stability, much less the survival of the state, no matter how long and harsh the conflict, so long as it remains conventional. So the U.S. is saying that if there was a conflict, say, in the South China Sea, uh, China would suffer immeasurably and the U.S. would be relatively isolated from it. This is why they would want to fight this conflict sooner rather than later. After 2025, it gets harder and harder for the U.S. to figure out how they would actually even hurt China economically. If the, the Belt and Road Initiative diversifies China's trade away from maritime routes and, and over land and circumvents the, the Indo-Pacific region, how is the U.S. going to set back China's economy to the extent they seek to do so? When the U.S. says China is a threat to peace and stability in the South China Sea and, and it's going to endanger commerce, no, it's not. The U.S., in black and white, in papers the U.S. military itself has commissioned, talk about how a conflict would devastate China, how instability and, and security threats would cripple China's economy, would shut down China's commerce, the engine of growth driving its, its rise on the global stage. You could see how the U.S. is playing this double game where they're claiming it's China that's provoking this, this security threat in the Indo-Pacific region, but how it's actually the U.S. doing it and how the U.S. knows They've commissioned entire papers studying this, that these conflicts will hurt China, not help them. China will avoid them at all costs. The U.S. is obviously, and getting back to AUKUS, putting the mechanisms in place to ensure that it continues inching towards that, towards that conflict that's going to set not just China, but all of Asia back decades and ensure decades more of U.S. hegemony over the region and over the planet. So just keep all of this in mind. That's what AUKUS is all about. Uh, the nuclear submarines that Australia thinks they're going to be sailing, uh, they will come online years from now, and they will be part of a post-conflict between the U.S. and China, uh, part of the strategy of encircling and containing a knocked-down China and Asia, keeping them from ever rising and threatening Western hegemony ever again. 
you thought this video was useful, please like and share it. Think about subscribing. It helps the channel grow and it's free to do. I have a website, newatlas.report. All of my videos and articles are there. There is no paywall. There never will be. I'm not allowed on social media. So besides on YouTube or Odyssey, you can find all of my articles, all of my videos, all of my work there for free. Check the video description for all of the links that I just covered in this video. There's a lot of them for this video. Please look through them. Uh, this is not something that we want to believe is inevitable, but it's something the U.S. is definitely engineering and, and working very hard to implement. It's very important to be familiar with all of this. There's also ways in the video description to help support my work to everyone who has been, whether it's through Patreon month to month, one-time donations, or even if you're just sharing, liking and sharing my work, all of that helps out a lot. I would not be able to do this without that support. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.